Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study, where we will study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Maria F., and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater, and I'm from County Dublin in Ireland, and I'll be your host for today's study. Our co-hosts today are Nancy J., Sue L., and Audrey O. If you have any questions or any concerns during the meeting, please contact either the host or any of the co-hosts by private message, and you can do this in the chat function. Please note that the speaker today, Harlan G, will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, the question and answer session which follows will not be recorded. And we will put a link to the previous recordings in the chat function. We ask if you can please keep your microphone on mute at all times during today's study. And also please turn off your video if you're exercising, you're eating, or if you need to step away from your screen for any reason. We also ask that you refrain from making use of the chat function <clears throat> even to message other attendees privately, just so we can all be present with each other today in the workshop. We've also disabled the mute for security reasons. So when it comes to the question and answers, you'll receive a message um, that asks, asks you to give you permission to unmute yourself. Besides that, we'll be muted for the duration of the study. So over to you. Good morning, Harlan. Good morning, Maria, and thank you very much for your service, and thank you to all the people that make this possible. I'm so very honored to be here, and uh, thank you guys for coming back. Last week, we had the OA birthday, so we took a one-week hiatus, and I'm certainly so, one, so honored that you're back today. You know, for thousands and thousands of years, going all the way back to King Solomon of Israel, Alcoholics have suffered tremendous, tremendously, and they have been ostracized and they have been institutionalized. And it's just been a, a horrible, horrible plight for the alcoholic or the, and or the drug addict. Yes, they did have drug addicts many, many thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago. As a matter of fact, they even fought a war over opium between England and China in about the 1500s, I believe that happened. And they had laudanum and they had painkillers and they had cocaine, they had heroin, whatever it is that they had. But 125 years ago, you could have bought heroin over the counter. It was advertised as a way of regulating your bowels. And if you look at the history of Coca-Cola, the coca in Coca-Cola stood for the little splash of cocaine that they put in each serving of it to pep you up. And that's where Pepsi gets its name too. Pepsi, pep, peps you up, gets you going. And then when cocaine became illegal over the counter, they, sac they sacrificed, they substituted um, uh, caffeine in the place of the cocaine and the caffeine was there to pump you up as well. Well, King Solomon wrote of alcoholism thousands of years ago in the book of Solomon that he believed that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no cure for it. And in the 1640s, there was a doctor and Dr. Trotter was his name. Dr. Trotter wrote a paper in the 1640s in which he believed that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no cure for it at all. As far back, excuse me, as, as uh, 1790, in 1790, the Surgeon General of the United States, a man by the name of Benjamin Rush, he was the very first Surgeon General of the United States. And in 1790, he wrote a paper. And in that paper, he said that he believed that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and there was no cure for it at all. And through history, there have been many atrocities visited upon the alcoholics. They have been stoned. They have been ostracized. They have been killed. They have been put into asylums and prisons. And they have been shut away from society for hundreds and hundreds of years. You could even do lobotomies on alcoholics. It was considered a form 
form of madness. Through the centuries, there have been many famous people, people who were very visible, who suffered from alcoholism and they died in their cups. Going all the way back to Alexander the Great, he was an alcoholic and he died drunk. And the first president of our United States, uh, George Washington, his wife, Martha Custis Washington, was an alcoholic. As a matter of fact, in Chicago, where I was born and raised on uh, Western Avenue and Irving Park Boulevard, Western and Irving Park, there is a hospital to this day. I believe it's still there. It's called Martha Washington Hospital. And Martha Washington Hospital was not the kind of hospital when it first opened that it is now. It was a drying out center. It was a place to put alcoholics so that they could dry out, named for Martha Custis Washington. The second president of the United States, John Adams, had a son named Charles. And Charles had all the wealth and prestige and money and everything that you could want. And Charles Adams, one of the sons of John Adams, he died in alcoholism. He died from the, T, uh, from the DTs. He died from his alcoholism. And he had every known advantage, as did Martin. Martha Washington, as did Alexander the Great in their time. Vincent Van Gogh was an alcoholic and he died alone as an, he not alone, he died drunk. He died as an alcoholic as well. Uh, famous entertainers, you know, many, many of them, but Jackie Gleason, Art Carney, little side note to Art Carney. Uh, Art Carney was an alcoholic, but so was his brother, Bill. Bill Carney, Bill C. was an alcoholic. And it was Bill C., Art Carney's brother, Bill, that first brought the serenity prayer to the attention of Bill Wilson and Hank Parkhurst. And Bill Wilson, it was in an obituary in New York. It appeared in an obituary and Bill Wilson said at the time that he first viewed the serenity prayer, he had never seen so much AA in so few words. And from that point forward, it became uh, ubiquitous with AA life. It became a regular thing in AA life to meditate on and say the serenity prayer. Uh, so you had U Ulysses S. Grant, just to, just to kind of round out the, the roster here. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but we'll get going. I won't spend the whole hour, you know, talking about who is an alcoholic. But Ulysses S. Grant, who was the 18th president of the United States, uh, he was an alcoholic. He was a blackout drinker. He was an absolute blackout drinker, U.S. Grant. And he uh, died in his cups. There was nothing that could be done for these people. They have been, as I say, ostracized. They have been institutionalized. They have been imprisoned. In some extreme cases, they have had lobotomies. They've had invasive surgeries. They've had all manner of degradating behavior thrust upon them because of their alcoholism and because we couldn't really understand how to treat the alcoholic. It was considered, as I say, a lack of, um, a lack of character, a lack of discipline, and it was considered a form of madness. We had obesity, we had gluttony, King Henry VIII, uh, was a glutton. King Henry VIII would sit and, you know, eat massive quantities of food. And he was a very, very large man, very obese man. Caligula, uh, one of the emperors of Rome, Caligula was a sex addict, obviously, if you know anything about the history of Caligula, he was very oversexed. He, uh, he, he would have orgies in the palace, but he also had massive quantities of food and drink. And he would, inst he would ins have installed vomitoriums where these guys could purge the food that they had just eaten and then eat more and more and more. And through history, we have many instances of addiction. Now, why am I talking about that? What does that have to do with today? I want you to know that what we are going to embark on today changed the course of human history. 
that never again will the alcoholic, never again will the drug addict, the gambler, the sex addict, the Al-Anon, never again will somebody have to die without there being a solution close by. Maybe they will die. That's unfortunate. And all of us have lost loved ones that we know were lost to addiction, but there is help available. And this morning, we are going to talk about a very, very special man, a man who turned the world into a different direction. And I'm not talking about Bill Wilson. I'm talking about William Duncan Silkworth. And we're gonna start on page XXV. We're gonna start on XXV. Now, what we're about to embark on this morning is the doctor's opinion. And without the doctor's opinion, there's no program. So Bill Wilson could have written the most fantastic big book. And I believe that he did with, you know, obviously with divine uh, intervention, divine inspiration. I do not believe that Bill Wilson penned this book out of the thin air. When, when the big book was printed on April the 10th, 1939, Bill Wilson had four years of sobriety. I have 23 years of abstinence, and I'm lucky if I can knock out a coherent text message for the love of God. And Bill Wilson wrote one of the most world-altering, unbelievable pieces of spiritual literature that the world had seen in 2,000 years. It had been a long, long time, thousands of years since the world had glimpsed anything that could approach its equal. But we're gonna talk this morning, not so much about Bill Wilson, but we're gonna talk about the man, William Duncan Silkworth. And William Duncan Silkworth in 1929 was a little, a little over-invested in the stock market. He was a little over-invested in the stock market like um, Will Chamberlain was a little tall. He was overinvested in the stock market. And when Black Tuesday came, October the 29th, 1929, and the world was plunged into depression, he lost so much of what he had. He was a neurologist, unconcerned with alcoholism, unconcerned with treating alcoholics. He was a neurologist, but he went to his friend, Charlie Towns. Charlie Towns owned and operated the Towns Hospital at 293 Central Park West in New York City. And 293 Central Park West is today a condo building or an apartment building. But a lot of people, if you look at some of the uh, Facebook posts and stuff, they'll still go out there and they'll have their picture taken at 293 Central Park West. It's in Manhattan and uh, it's where the Towns Hospital was. Towns Hospital was essentially a place where New York playboys and wealthy people could go and dry out. Uh, people, you know, the, the Broadway stars or TV stars, a lot of TV was shot in New York in the early, early days. But these are mostly Broadway people, business people, Wall Street people. And the bottom line is, is that this was the Towns Hospital and Charlie Towns developed. And we're going to be talking about that when we get to doctors, when we get to Bill's story. He developed the Belladonna treatment. Belladonna was essentially a poison. And what Charlie Towns believed is that he could cut the poison with chemicals so that it would soothe the alcoholic down. It would calm him, quiet him down so that he could detox. Because one of the big dangers of detoxing an alcoholic is the delirium tremens. These guys are shaking like an Airedale trying to crap out a peach pit. You talk about 
having a drinking problem, if they lifted a glass to their mouth, even if it was just coffee, they'd often throw it on the person behind them because they just they just couldn't do it. And I've been, uh, I lived in Eugene, Oregon for uh, nine years. And when I was in Eugene, Oregon, they, they don't have OA in Eugene, Oregon. At least they didn't when I lived there. The closest meeting would be Portland or you'd have to go to, um, uh, Stan where Stanford is, that those were the closest meetings is the Bay Area, or you had um, the uh, Portland meetings they had, but Eugene, they didn't have OA. And I had to go to the AA groups and I'm forever grateful. I'm, I'm going to stop and say something here. I am forever grateful to the new freedom group, the new freedom group of AA that meets on the, in the church on Coburg Road, for accepting me. They knew my secret. They knew I was not an alcoholic. Not only did they allow me in their meetings, they welcomed me with open arms and they encouraged me and invited me and went out of their way to make me feel welcome in their intensive big book studies, in their intensive step work. They went out of their way to make me feel not only welcome, but a part of their group. And I will forever be grateful Grateful to the New Freedom AA group in Eugene on Coburg Road. But anyway, that aside, I'd see these guys sitting in there and they'd be trying to drink a cup of coffee and they'd be shaking so much, the coffee would be all over the place. Well, the heart is a muscle too. And the heart, when it becomes affected by delirium tremens, that's not, a, that's not good. <laughs> that is not good. And the situation be, can become very grave, very soon, very quickly. And he believed that if he could take this belladonna and cut it with some chemicals, that these guys would calm down long enough so that they could detox them. And he developed this belladonna treatment, which was pivotal in the history of the treatment of alcoholics. Very, very important stuff here. But let's get back to the Dr. Silkworth, because he's the subject of what we're talking about here. In November of 1929, William D. Silkworth became the medical director of the town's hospital. $35 per week was his salary. Could you imagine being a doctor and working for $35 a week? But this was the height of the depression. The depression had just started. People were out of work. The unemployment rate among whites was 50 to 60%. The unemployment rate among minorities was 80, 90, and 100% among minorities. So you can see in the old newsreels, people waiting for soup, waiting for handouts, and they had nothing. There was absolutely nothing to be had. It was, an, it was not a good situation for anybody. And it was just a horribly, horribly nightmarish situation for businesses and farmers. The Dust Bowl was going on out in Oklahoma and it was not a good situation. Okay, William Duncan Silkworth becomes medical director of the town's hospital in November of 1929. And through observation, no scientific testing, no scientific data was recorded, just through observation, he noticed of all the people that came through that these people would get in trouble with alcohol or drugs and they would bring them into the town's hospital and they would patch them up and they would feed them and they would pump them with B12 and they would you know, take care of their medical needs and they would go. Now about 10% of these guys, mostly men, but that's overgeneralizing. There was Flo Rankin and there was Marty Mann that came along later, but mostly men, not, not completely, but mostly men. And what would happen is he started to notice that about 10% of these guys would come back maybe the next day, maybe the next month, maybe the next 
six months, whatever it was. And they were in worse shape than he had ever seen them before in his life. And he preached to them and he would say, look, you can't drink and blah, blah, blah. And they would release him. And then again, that certain percentage of these guys, I don't mean guys, all men, I mean, patients, let's say patients, that's more generic, patients. Certain percentage of these patients just couldn't seem to drink safely. That every time they drank, there were problems. That the when one they one when they took one. Now that I knew I'd get it out of my mouth eventually. When they took one, they would take as many as they could get their hands on, and if they didn't take any, they were okay except for some nervousness, some restlessness, some discontentedness, some frustration, some fear, some anger, some agitation. If they didn't take any, they would react much like normal people. And he started to surmise through observation that there was something different about these guys that go in and out and in and out and in and out. And his theory became very clear to him. And William Duncan Silkworth's theory will change the world. The world will never be the same because of a little doctor who loved drunks. Let's see what he has to say. And let's go to page XXV in the fourth edition. The doctor's opinion, very important. It's an opinion because he doesn't have the facts to back it up, but he knows it in the same way you know today is Saturday. You just know it in your gut. Did you ever know something in your gut and people all around you are saying, no, no, you're crazy, but you knew it and you knew you were right and it turned out that you were right? This is what he's, this is what he's dealing with here. Just to be a nudnik sometimes when I, I go to my cardiologist every six months. I didn't do this the other day. I was there on Monday. I was there Monday. And I got my test back and I'm, I'm okay. I heard the nurse, not the nurse, but the, the medical person that called me says, doctor says, we're just going to stay on the same medication. Everything we're doing is, is fine. He said, your weight is fine. I said, wait a minute. What did you say? I made her repeat it like three times. Your weight is fine. And I was like, I don't know how to dance very well, but if I could have, I would have river danced when I heard that one. But the bottom, could you see me river dancing? Wouldn't that be a sight? But anyway, the bottom line is I was so thrilled and now I have to go for blood tests. I'm hoping that they'll be okay too, but it's a fasting blood test. Now, I never like fasting, but it's a fasting blood test. But I got a good, so far, so good on the, uh, they took images and they look here and turn your hand this way. It's pick your arm up this way, turn this way. You know, my God, it's like unbelievable. But anyway, okay. We of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan. Oh, I didn't finish my point. Sometimes just to be a nudnik when they'll say, who's your primary care physician? I'll put down William D. Silkworth, 293 Central Park West, just to be a nudnik, but I didn't do it this time. I'll do it next time. Okay. We of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. Now let's stop right there just for a second here. You have convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who've had experience with the sufferings of our members and have witnessed our return to health. Never before in the history of earth have there been alcoholics who returned to health. The mathematical odds that a human being could lose the amount of weight that I have lost and keep that weight off for 18, 19 years 
is zero. It cannot be done. Mathematically, the probability that someone will do what God has done in me is zero. And yet here I am. I might drop dead tonight. I have no, I might not be able to finish the session. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow, I don't know what it, two seconds from now brings, let alone tomorrow, forget tomorrow. But the bottom line is that they have returned to health. Unbelievable. A well-known doctor, chief physician at a nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. To whom it may concern, now this is all Silkworth now, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. The patient that he's referring to here is William G. Wilson, or who we would know as Bill W., Bill Wilson. Now, when he says hopeless, let's stop right there for just a minute. When he says hopeless, just remember that what it means to me is you are out of ideas. And one of the things that has to happen for me to recover from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body is I have to be out of ideas. Out of ideas about what? Out of ideas about who may become the next coach of the Bears? Out of ideas about how we could send a man to the moon? No, no. I have to be out of ideas on how I'm going to do this on my own by myself. And one of the things that happens in our ego, in our tempestuous ego-driven madness is we tell people and ourselves, I don't need that. I can do this on my own. I'm just going to follow a diet. I don't need Overeaters Anonymous. There's 161 people on the line this morning, which I'm flattered. But of the 161 people that are on the line this morning, I would wager there's none of those people that didn't say to themselves, I don't need Overeaters Anonymous. I got this. I'm just going to do this on my own. And how did that work out for me? Well, here I am, and I'm glad to be here, but I cannot do this on my own. I cannot do this by myself. I need the help of God. I need the help of my fellow sufferer. I need to be one of many. I need to be a member of Overeaters Anonymous. Otherwise, I will die. When that meeting starts every day, vision for you, I'm on that line. Not because I want to be, not because I should be. I need that as, as like you need air to breathe. Every day I go to my meeting on Zoom every day, whatever it is, I do what I need to do because I am convinced beyond reason that I cannot do this on my own nor by myself. I have to have you around me. Let's continue. In the course of his third treatment, now we have some conflicts here. In Bill's story in the big book, he will recount three hospitalizations at the town's hospital. In Pass It On, they will say that he was hospitalized four times. And there are biographies that bear out that he was indeed hospitalized four times. Whether it was three, four, or 31 is not the point. Let's continue. In the course of his third treatment, something very important happened between hospitalization number two and hospitalization number three. He is going to come in contact with the Oxford group movement of the day, and he is going to have a life-changing situation in that he will become a member of the Oxford group movement through his friend, Ebby Edwin 
Ebby Thatcher. We'll get into that in much detail when we get to Bill's story. We're going to pull it apart and we'll go into the whole history of it at that time, not today. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics. In other words, immediately upon getting this information, what does he do with it? He gives it to other alcoholics. That is why we work the steps quickly. That is why, because the faster I can start giving this to other people, the faster I can, the better is my recovery. Very, very important. And we're going to see lots of instances of the textbook, which this is a textbook telling me to work this quickly rather than slowly. And I'm going to point them out to you every time we get to one, because I want that information in your noggin. And the only way that information is really going to stay in your noggin is if you teach it incessantly to others impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has, become, this has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. Now, for the first time in the history of this world, Never before. I want to keep emphasizing this. Alcoholics loved ones were sold snake oil and they were sold products of snake oil and crooks would prey upon them in the same way that crooks and shysters and quacks prey on the obese today. They want to sell us pills and capsules and potions and all manner of craziness. Now, when I came into Overeaters Anonymous, 1979, February 2nd, 1979, everything that was Japanese was in fashion, in vogue. And one of the things that was in high fashion at that time was acupuncture. And I'm not knocking acupuncture. I have no opinion on acupuncture at all. I'm not for it. I'm not against it. I don't care. OA doesn't care. I'm not knocking it. I'm not giving you an opinion. I'm just telling you what I saw. And a lot of the gals that I went to meetings with, they would go and get acupuncture and they were supposed to pull their ear every time they wanted to eat. And that was supposed to kill their appetite. I think they forgot a couple of times maybe to pull their ear because it didn't seem to be working. And another thing that was in vogue, when I came into OA, there were a lot of people, not just gals, there were guys doing it. There were a lot of people, I think there were guys doing it. I didn't do it, thank God. They would go to a doctor and they would pay money to have the uh, urine of a pregnant woman shot up their butt and they would shoot the urine of the pregnant woman up the butt, and this was supposed to help you lose weight. So you had the Carol Burnett crew, you know, Carol Burnett used to signal to her grandmother, uh, hello, by pulling on her ear, and you had the crew that were going to get the urine of um, pregnant woman shot up their butts, and that was what you had. So, None of that worked, of course. But here is Dr. Silkworth in this first letter saying to the world, hey, this treatment, this thing has produced people, over 100 of them that have recovered. Now, there really weren't 100, but that, that's not even the point. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. Now let's take a look at that sentence because it's very, very important. If, we, if, I, if the pay and ways had worked, I wouldn't be here. If the diet pills, the amphetamines that I was on worked, I wouldn't be here. I'm here because those things failed me. Remember lose weight with AIDS? Not the disease, 
AYDS. They were little candies. If you're not my age, if you're too young, you won't remember this, but they used to advertise it on TV incessantly. They were little caramel candies that you would eat and they were supposed to kill your appetite. So here I am eating caramel candy with this chemical in there and it's supposed to kill my appetite. Come on, come on. AYDS, lose weight with AIDS. And then there was Dexatrim. And then there was this pay and way and that pay and way. And then there was Victanis, which became the Chicago Health Club. No matter what they advertised on TV, no matter what they put out there, I continued to gain weight. Metrical, that was another one. Drink Metrical. Drink Metrical and watch those pounds wash away. Remember those? If you're my age, you remember that. You remember all that stuff. What is one of the biggest sections of the drugstore today is the weight loss section. Does any of that stuff work? It all works, but not for people like us. Not for people that have this disease and what the disease is, we'll get into as we move forward. But everything I tried failed completely. These facts appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. These men may well have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. Now, this letter is actually a cover letter for a fundraising situation that Bill and Hank Parkhurst were engaged in back in the 1930s when AA was just considering writing this book. Only two chapters were written at this time, Bill's story and there is a solution. That was it. That was all you had of this book was two chapters. And this letter that we just read from Silkworth was a cover letter. And it was a cover letter that was going to a guy named Frank Chipman. And this was a cover letter for funds that they were going to solicit from the Rockefeller Foundation. But Bill had the letter, talked to Silkworth, and he included it as the first of the letters in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Very important that we also take note of something that's, that we should look at. When the big book was printed in, on April the 10th, 1939, and for the mimeographed multilith copies that came before it, and for all of the books that came after it up to a certain point, Dr. Silkworth's name did not appear. Now, the reason that it did not appear is because Silkworth was very afraid that if his information was assailed on a scientific level, he could not back it up. And he was afraid and he was scared that they would run him out of the medical profession. And if he ran, if he was run out of the medical profession, how is he going to make a living and take care of his family? Well, the situation was such that he did not want his name in there. So for the first edition, for 10 printings of the first edition, you did not have his name in there. And then in 1949, Harry Tebow, who was Bill's psychiatrist, Harry Tebow wrote a paper in 1949, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association accepted alcoholism on Tebow's paper. And there were some other papers that came in as well, that alcoholism was an illness. And he said later on, you can put my name in there now. And William Silkworth died in 1951. 1951, he passed away. The 11th printing took place in 1950. The second edition came out in 55 that he had his name. In 1955, the second edition had it. But the bottom line is, is that he stuck his neck out to write this for the book. But he said to Bill, don't you put my name in there. But on the, on the letter that he wrote for the fundraiser, it did have his name. When it came into the book, it did not. And now it does. 
it's important to remember our history. It's important to remember where we come from. This, it, you know, you get the impression sometimes that Bill met Bob and AA sprung out of their ears. That is not the case. That is absolutely not the case. This was fraught with a lot of blood, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. The men and women who brought this forward were pioneers and they were soldiers for God in every sense of the word. These were people that were very, very hard pressed to pay their bills. These were people that were very hard pressed to devote the kind of energy and time that this required, but they did it and they and thank God they did it because if we didn't have this, we wouldn't have OA. And if we didn't have OA, I for one would be in Waldheim Cemetery right outside Chicago and I would be cemetery uh, fodder, fertilizer at this point. I would have been dead many, many, many years ago and I would have begged God for death. And it's not that I'm alive, it's that I wanna be alive and I'm living my life. That's the miracle of OA. Let's continue with the doctor's opinion. And we're back now to what Bill Wilson is gonna write, not what Dr. Silkworth is gonna write. When it's Silkworth, I'll tell you it's Silkworth. When it's Bill, I'll tell you it's Bill. The physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough <clears throat> to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement, he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. Let's stop right there. Centuries, centuries have gone by of people for thousands of years who believed that alcoholism was a form of madness. They would put alcoholics in the insane asylum. They would put alcoholics in jails. They would put alcoholics in places you wouldn't send your worst enemy. They did lobotomies on them. They treated them like human garbage. They were weak. They lacked willpower. They had no character. They needed to go to church or synagogue. They needed to understand what they're doing to their poor wife and children. They needed to grow up and get a pair. They needed to use some willpower. Have they no dignity? It has nothing to do with that. But what do all those things have in common? They were attacking the mind, not attacking, that's not the right word. They were considering the mind and nobody up to this point had considered a physical part of this disease. Nobody, nobody, not Solomon, not Trotter, not Rush, none of them. Rush Street in Chicago, named for Benjamin Rush. If you come to Chicago, you're gonna see a very touristy place, touristy street, Rush Street, named after Benjamin Rush. Okay, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. So for the very first time in written history, you have a consideration other than the mental. Let's see where he goes from there. That the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as, as his mind. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality or were outright mental defectives. This flies in the face 
of thousands and thousands of years of opinion that says we were in flight from reality. We were mental defectives. There was something wrong with our brains. And he is saying, no, that is not it. Gutsy, gutsy. If it wasn't for Silkworth, there is no program. If it wasn't for Silkworth, there is no program. I said it twice because I want you to appreciate where we come from. I want you to appreciate what we are and what we have. Bill's great. Hank's great. Bob's great. Fitz is all these guys. Fantastic. Without Silkworth, there's nothing to build on. Nothing. The program of recovery makes no sense. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. What a statement. He is making this statement purely on observation. At Yale University for many years, in their alcoholic studies program, they used science rather than observation. And they measured the body and mind of an alcoholic drinking, a drug addict drugging, a compulsive overeater eating compulsively, and gamblers gambling. And they found that they could verify that there is indeed a physical component to this disease. And the way that it lights up in the laboratory is identical the drug addict, the alcoholic, the compulsive overeater, the anorexic, the bulimic, the, the, it lights up identically. There is no discernible difference one to the other, none, none. So let's see where he goes from here because this is breakthrough information, breakthrough information. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic of the alcoholic, which leaves out this physical factor, is incomplete. What guts this man had. The little doctor who loved drunks. He saved your life. The doctor's theory that we have an allergy, we're going to come back to that word allergy, to alcohol interests us. As layman, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say his explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Now, let's take a look at this word allergy. And when I first came into Overeaters Anonymous in 1979, Friday night, February 2nd, 1979, at the Orchard Mental Health Center, God likes to laugh too, the Orchard Mental Health Center in Skokie, Illinois, which was 15, 20 minutes from my home. I lived on Devon and Albany at that time, right by the Red Hot Ranch. But the bottom line is I went there on a Friday night against my will, and they all said to me, don't eat milk duds, you're allergic to them. And I said, that can't be true. I've been eating milk duds since I was knee high to a grasshopper. I used to buy boxes of milk duds and put them in my popcorn at the movie theater. And I would sit at the Northtown Theater on, the, on Western near Rosemont, and I'd watch whatever movie was playing. And I had my popcorn, and I had the milk duds and that in there, and I had raisinets in there, and I had a whole mishmash of stuff in there, and I loved it. But they'd say, don't eat milk duds, you're allergic to them. And I say, that can't be because I don't break out in hives. I don't break out in a rash. I don't get a sneezy, itchy, watery throat, nor do I get watery eyes when I eat milk duds. What are you guys talking about? And they said, never mind, just don't eat milk duds. And that bothered me. And I went to a source of information at that time that is archaic now. Nobody uses them anymore. If you're my age, you remember what a dictionary is. You remember dictionaries? The young people are saying, what's dictionary? We better Google that. No, a dictionary has words that you can look up and find out how to spell them, 
well, you better know how to kind of spell them or you won't be able to look them up, but spell them, how to pronounce them and what the words mean. And this word allergy, like a lot of words, had several different meanings. And one of the meanings of this word allergy fit me exactly correctly. It said an adverse abnormal reaction to a food, beverage, or substance. Adverse means it's harmful. Abnormal means most people don't react to food the way I do. Now, when I eat candy or when I eat french fries or I eat uh, egg rolls over at Kumun on Richmond and Devon, something abnormal and harmful happens in my body. What is it? And that is I am set up with an actual physical craving for more. In the body of my friends, when they would eat a hot dog or they would eat an egg roll or they would eat pizza, they get all the pizza they want when they sit down and eat pizza. The more pizza they eat, the less pizza they want. And sometimes there'd be a couple of slices of pizza left on the tray and somebody would say, who wants them? And Harlan would be grabbing them and they'd be going, oh no, I'm done. Oh, I'm stuffed. Oh, that's too much. Who could eat that much pizza? And I just wanted to test power tools on their skulls. I didn't understand. Oh, I'm full. Oh, that's too sweet. Oh, that's too much food. Oh my God, how can anybody eat so much? And I just want to test nuclear weapons on their house. But the bottom line is in my body, once I eat these commodities, I want more. And the more I eat, the more I want. The more I want, the more I eat. The more I eat, the more I want. And it's just endless. There's no end to it. Either I'm ashamed of eating that much in front of you. So I mercifully stop knowing I'm gonna go to Rosen's drugstore on Devon and get more candy later, knowing I'm gonna go to 7-Eleven and get more stuff later, or I run out of money or we have to go for some reason. That's the only reason I stopped. That's the only reason I ever stopped. And I watched people, normal temperate eaters, and their mothers or fathers would split a McDonald's hamburger and give one sibling half a hamburger and the other sibling half a hamburger and neither one of the siblings could finish their half of a hamburger. And I looked in awe at their willpower, at their fortitude, at their strength. And I thought, they are good and I am bad. They deserve to live and I deserve to die. I'm weak and they're strong. I'm bad and they're good. Because that's what society had told me that if I was more like them, I would be okay. If I was more like them, I would have a good life. If I was more like them, people would like me. If I was more like them, I wouldn't be made fun of. If I was more like them, I would be okay. And I can't be like them. I couldn't be like them when we were six. I couldn't be like them when I was 20. And I can't be like them now that I'm 67. And I never will be like them. Not in this life, because I have a body, a physical body that reacts differently, adversely and abnormally when certain foods or certain ingredients are in, in that food. My body will set itself up with an actual physical craving for more of the same. And there is nothing I can do about that except cease ingesting those foods or those ingredients, nothing. 
the allergy is unalterable. If I ate sugar today, milk duds, Whoppers, not Burger King Whoppers, but the malted milk balls, bubble gum, Butterfinger bars, Reese's peanut butter, the list goes on and on. That allergy would kick in, not where I left off, it would be worse than ever. Remember that the disease has two characteristics, the physical allergy and the twist of the mind, but it has three properties. The properties are it's permanent, progressive, and fatal. Permanent, progressive, it gets worse over time, and abstinence does not treat the disease. I'm going to say that again, because that's going to freak you out. And I'm going to get questions on this in a few minutes here. Abstinence does not treat this disease. Only a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps will treat the disease. Abstinence is vital to my survival. Please don't call me tomorrow and say, or tonight and scream, you said I don't have to be abstinent. I never said anything of the kind. I said abstinence does not treat the disease any more than sobriety treats alcoholism. Man of 30 was doing some spree drinking. He remained bone dry for 25 years. Out came his carpet slippers, his pipe and carpet slippers in a bottle. Within four years, he was dead. Did he pick up where he left off? Absolutely not. The disease progressed even though he wasn't drinking. Man of 30 doing some spree drinking and we're gonna see the progressive properties there in chapter three, more about alcoholism. And we're gonna see it all over Bill's story, but the physical allergy cannot be muted unless I do not ingest those ingredients or foods. I hope everybody understands that because some of the more crazy hostile <laughs> questions come up when I say that when I'm on the road. Abstinence does not treat this disease. Only a spiritual awakening will treat this illness. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as an altruistic plane, Altruism comes to us from the Oxford groupers. And Frank Buckman, the founder of the Oxford group movement, found that when people gave of themselves with no expectation of a return, that they were happier people and could more readily dedicate themselves to their Christianity. He was not concerned with alcoholism. He was concerned with instilling enthusiasm back into first century Christianity. He was on a mission in China and he saw altruism working where nothing else was. If you want to feel good about yourself, you feel like you've lost your conscious contact with God, reach out for one of God's children. Be of service to one of God's children, and that spirit will, will reinstill in you, I promise you, as long as you have no expectation of a return on your investment of time. Once you start e expecting something, then, it, then it's not altruism, then it's manipulation. Big, big difference. Though we work out us for the alcoholic who is very jittery, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative. Imperative means it is important above all else. Now, I just told you that abstinence does not treat the disease any more than sobriety treats alcoholism, but that a man's brain be cleared before he is approached as he then has a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. This is the first of three times that Silkworth is going to tell us, put down the food. I'm going to say it two more times, put down the food. You're going to ask me in the questions, how do I put down the food? You put it down by putting it down. And then you're going to say, follow up question, Tubby. If I'm powerless over food, how am I going to put it down? You are powerless. You are not helpless. You are powerless, but you have all been on diets for a couple of days. You put the food down. And until you put the food down, he's going to tell us this three times, 
nothing can be done for you. Nothing. If you're still drinking, you are not going to have a spiritual awakening as a result of anything. If you're still eating, you're not going to have a spiritual awakening. You're already getting the effect from the food. You, you're not going to need the effect of the spiritual awakening. You're already getting it from the milk duds. You're already getting it from the pizza or from the fried stuff or whatever it is. You ice cream, whatever the hell it is. You got to put it down. Okay. Next week, we're going to go to the second letter that Dr. Silkworth is going to write to us. The second letter. And we're going to examine letter number two. And we're going to start next Saturday on page XXVII. Now, before I turn it over to Maria or Nancy or whomever, I don't know, I'm just going to remind you of a few things. Number one, I'm so happy that you're with me today. I'm so happy. <clears throat> March the 13th, right? Wait a minute. Make, me sh make sure I'm giving you the right day. Okay. March the 13th is a Sunday. And what happens on March the 13th is all of you except Arizona and Hawaii will go back on daylight savings time. So our regular Sunday through Thursday meetings, and we may add a Friday, I don't know, all those meetings uh, in March, not today, not tomorrow, March 13th, okay, will start one hour later unless you are in Arizona, and then they'll be the same time. On Saturday, the 19th of March, this big book study, unless you are in Arizona, wait, if, if you're in Arizona, it'll start at 10 a.m. Otherwise, it'll start at the same time. It'll be 10 a.m. So it, no, it's noon, in Chicago, noon central. So it'll be an hour later. That'll be an hour later too. So if you have questions about the time zones, let's hold off on that today as it gets closer. If you're on Eastern or Central, it's very, very simple. Everything will go an hour later unless you're in Arizona and then it'll be the same time. I'll start at 10. No, it won't be. I'll start at 10 Arizona time instead of 11 Arizona time. Okay. Maria, oh, no math questions.